headache I got wasn't from an axe in the head, but from a half a can of wine. My older brother, Jakes, gave it to me along with ten cigarettes and the instruction to go forth and become a man. I'm twelve years old. This is my very good fortune. Thanks, Woody. Now, this is the ritual. The ritual that I see all around me. The only ritual that I ever practice religiously. This drinking ritual seems very important because at any occasion everyone is taking out all kinds of bottles from their cooler boxes. Beer, Kali Castle, Brandy, Kiptruf and Balls. And then there's also the Three Ships Whiskey. Then all the grown-ups become very clever and loud. Run away, Lord, my star. Run away, Lord, my star. Run away, Lord, my star. What the police do, Khan? Yes. That first drinking night, my friend Darby and I became motherless. We smoked like troopers and ended up offering all those good times right back onto the study carpet. <laughs> Cleaning a vomit stained carpet the next morning wasn't the best gear for a hangover. But now we become the main manner, the blokes that knows what is what. My one friend lived in a block of flats, now the flat boy, the black janitor. He gets sent to buy half jacks or nippies, vodka or brandy. Then, at the public pool, around the corner, behind the wall, there we do our drinking ritual. Main. Monday after a drinking session, I felt very guilty sitting among all the good little boys and girls. I remember once my math teacher asked me to do an equation on the blackboard. There I'm standing, knees shaking with a bubble loss, a hangover. I could feel the dead brain cells floating around in my skull. Very guilty. But to be in with my drinking brothers, a year older than me and ahead of, of me at school, gave me some inner strength and standing. Well, at least in my own movie mind. Come, 29, double danger. Water above, water below, leading to an imbalance, leading to flooding on the way. When the floodgate opens, confusion and turmoil. To be tied in a thicket of thorns and dead wood and still be lost, this is bad luck. How's it? My one friend started making his own beer, home brew. This was a murky liquid that kicks like a wild donkey. <laughs> the downside was it gave you a runny tummy, so you just had to pray that you didn't foul your pants before the buzz kicked in. <laughs> and then we started our own band. The three slop chips. Wang. The three limp fries. Wang. I was 17, my fellow band members 18. People better listen now. There's no time to explain E minor and C. Bombers dropping death and destruction all around. People. We had two gigs, one at a school concert and one at a garage party, but we only knew five songs. <laughs> so after the first set, we would go and have beer and wine, get the bus going, and then return to try the second set. But now that we were nice and sloshed, the same song sounded different, and the audience got five brand new numbers to dance to. <laughs> Clever, eh? <sighs> I had big dreams of becoming a muso. You know, the dude from a band, the dude with long hair, dirty jeans, and lots of girls. And then at the end of my school days, I started going bald. And that was the first nail in my Muso Dream coffin. Also at the same time, my oldest brother died in the aeroplane accident. Falcon, always obsessed with flight. He would build those wooden airplanes for hours at a time. 
Springbok trampolinist, forever higher and higher. Then he dies in an aeroplane accident. Mother knocked my emotions. Following year, my drinking buddy band members left school to do their military service. We were forced to sacrifice two years for the army. That was the kill shot to my muso dream. And this two-year military sacrifice was also a fate that was awaiting me. And when I left, it would be the last time I saw Elsie alive. I'm down! conflict. The general's army may be afflicted with inefficient commanders. There is danger. At the time we reached the age of 18, us white boys were eligible to go and be killed for the apartheid regime. If you became a conscientious objector, they put you in jail for the two-year call-up period. Then, when you came out of jail, they called you up again for the original two years. Ridiculous. Oh, ingenious. The end of my final school year, I got my paper saying I was called up to Sultana, to the Navy. What the luck. Usually the only way to get into the Navy was to have connections, but here I was on my way to the sea. I thought this would be grand because my father lived in Cape Town. And seeing that him and my mother got separated, divorced, when I was only 12, this would be a perfect time to get to know him again. Yeah. <laughs> and there I was, at the station, ready to do my duty for my country, with my snot smear moustache, my new earring from my girlfriend, and lover's balls to boot. <laughs> As the train started rolling up, my girlfriend and I said goodbye for the last time, with a promise to be faithful forever. Yeah, well, no, fine. I didn't know about the dear Johnny letters yet. The train had not even left the station when the first corporal that saw me made me understand that my snot smear moustache and new earring did not secure my individuality and that it had to disappear as in now. Plus 50 push-ups of good measure. Late at night, we got woken with a lot of shouting only to be told, yes, 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 yes. Two coaches, traps, will be removed from your train, so you must just squat in and make do. Mark a plan. So I made a plan. I crawled in underneath the bottom bunk and made my bed on the floor. I fell asleep, and here I had the last wet dream of my life. <laughs> I dreamt my girlfriend and I were on the surfboard in the sea and we were making love. Probably with the rhythmic pitch and roll of the train, I picked up the motion of the ocean, and this rocked me to my climax. Not very romantic in a pair of jeans under a bunk in a stinky train. Arriving at Sultana Naval Base, they started dividing us into groups. Everyone was running around like headless chickens with the instructors shouting out orders. Who wants these scouts? Who knows how to sail? Etc. Etc. Me, as an Afrikaans lighty young man, had never even heard of Sea Scouts. And before I knew what was what, I was in a group of 250 other young men that got transferred to Kimberley, a grotty little town in the middle of nowhere. Gone were my dreams of naval life and the mythical reunion with my father. I got sent to the army to become a storm. <laughs> Like we used to sing, I joined the Navy to see the sea, but what did I see? Kimberly. <laughs> now see, I drink. A lot of men running, many steps, echoes of shouts. I'm standing at a great big dam. The walls tower above me like concrete waves. I feel the pressure and might of the water straining to break free. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a man dressed in a dark suit running towards me. He has a pump like a luger. 
the Germans used. He points the gun into my face. And as he's about to pull the trigger, I lift my arm to shield the blow. But now I have a sword in my hand, long and silver with a dangerous curve. I slice the man's head clean off his body. He tumbles and falls down the side of the damn wall. But as he falls, his head magically reattaches itself. He smiles back up at me. Now I'm standing on a stage, small, old, like amateur dramatics. It is a political rally, and the same fanatical men in dark suits are coming onto the stage, one by one. I chop off their heads, one by one, but it immediately grows back. They laugh fanatically and get great cheers from their fellow men waiting in line to take their turn. I stand helpless, with a sword in my hand. Now. I'm on a hillock, looking down on a building with red corrugated roof. I see that I have a sniper's rifle. My hands know exactly how to use this killing machine. I peer through the scope. I see a man dressed in traditional clothes. He's wearing a leopard skin skirt and headdress. He looks defiant, but calmly back at me. Then he smiles. Now, I'm running down corridors of books row upon row of old dusty tomes and volumes of encyclopedias. Up ahead, I catch a glimpse of the leopard skin skirt rounding a corner. I give chase, and now I have my quarry trapped. I stand helpless with a rifle in my hands. The man laughs and jumps through a wall. I'm in the army, and my lieutenant is shouting, Fear, Trupi, fear! Fire, soldier, fire! standing on a buffalo, a buffalo military vehicle, and my lieutenant is shouting at me to fire, ordering me to fire. In the wild, a buffalo is a majestic and fierce animal. With its impressive set of horns, it has meant the death of many a proud lion. But here in the township, the army vehicle, the buffalo, is a feared piece of metal striking terror into the hearts of many a young black child opposing it. We are here in the township, trying to contain the uprising of the Soweto school children. They are marching against the apartheid regime for having to learn Afrikaans at school. This is the hateful language of the oppressor. But it is also my language. And I love my language. Blossom. Louisa. Love. Liefde. Little can. Kaniki. Mountain, bath, fountain, fountain. But here I'm standing, holding an R1 rifle, the rifle of the oppressor. Fear, took me fear, fire, soldier, fire. If I don't obey my lieutenant, he's in his right to kill me here and now. I'm wearing the uniform of the oppressor. I am a soldier. My finger goes around the trigger, and here I'm just a number. Seven, six, three, six, three, two, seven, four, four, four. Not one that you can bet on. 7636-3274-BG. Three, three, but Elsie, what numbers do I choose? None of these numbers deserve to win anything. None of them.